Today, Christ followers meet in public worship spaces and secret gatherings to break bread together. Today, in wealthy churches and refugee camps, the cup is shared. Today, Jesus' call to remember me is spoken in many different languages by ordained clergy and volunteer pastors. Today, let us join God's people around the world in breaking bread of love and sharing a cup of faith. You're invited to stand as you are able and join us in our opening hymn. Good morning and welcome to worship here at United, Claremont United Church of Christ. And welcome to all of you worshiping with us online. We're so glad to see all of you gathered this morning. If you would take a moment and sign the pew pads and pass them down the row, we would love for you to take a look and see who is worshiping alongside you this morning. And if you're a visitor, we would love for you to leave us some contact information, an email or a phone number, so that Pastor Jacob and I can reach out and welcome you later this week. If you're worshiping online, we also invite you to sign in. And if you're a visitor with us there, we would also love to know who you are so that we can welcome you later this week. Lots of things happening today. As you can see, it's World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday in October every year. The global church celebrates communion together, and we see this as a way to remember that despite all of our differences, the way we worship, the, what we call ourselves, how we practice communion, we all share the bread and cup of Christ together that unites us all around the globe. And so we will be hearing more about that during our Sermon on the Steps, but we are excited to share that with all Christians around the world on this Sunday. Right after the worship service, out on the lawn, you can see some folks gathered there. We're having a baptism, and it's gonna be outdoors for that family, and so you're all welcome to join for that. And then right after that, down in our refectory, we are having a very special birthday party today for celebrating anyone in our congregation who is turning over the age of 90 this year. And I believe we have, Jacob, is it over 20 guests at this birthday party today? So we are very excited to celebrate those who have lived so long and have hopefully something to share with us about their wisdom and their joy in a long, joyful life. So please join us down there for Cake and Punch after worship. Finally, I want to let you know that um, our church, the conference that we are a part of, the Southern California Nevada Conference of the United Church of Christ, um, put out a call for a ceasefire because it has been one year, if you can believe it, since the uh, violence in the Middle East has erupted. And we no longer want to stay silent. We believe one year of war is one year too long. And so we as the church are stepping up 
And the conference put forth a call to action and they offered to match gifts up to $2,500 for a total of 5,000. And Claremont United Church of Christ jumped on this and said, we're gonna match your match. So we're gonna match you 2,500 and that means all gifts from all the churches in our conference will be matched now for a gift of $10,000 towards this um, humanitarian crisis. In addition to that, we're inviting you to sign postcards. They're out in the narthex on the uh, countertop. And these are um, postcards to the president that we are signing and we are talking about how we are deeply concerned as people of faith about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We are asking the US government to stop sending weapons of war to a situation in which civilians are clearly being harmed. That goes against um, international humanitarian law and our own laws as the United States of America. So we're inviting you to sign these as well. We're taking a stand. We are calling for a ceasefire. We believe that one year of this war is too long. So please join us in that. Finally, some announcements about fellowship, opportunities to connect with others in the congregation. Upcoming, uh, the weekend of October 18th to 20th, is our men's retreat. So if you identify as a man or you would like to be there that weekend, we invite you to find out for more information on how you can join in our men's retreat. It's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship and spiritual depth and growth and conversation. And we also have our connect group is planning a hike. So if you're not signed up for our Friday emails, you'll want to get involved with that. And our Voyagers group has a potluck coming up. And this Friday, our uh, Women Under 50 group, Glow, is having dinner and going to an escape room. So lots of things happening. Again, if you're not signed up for our Friday emails, you're probably missing these opportunities. So make sure you reach out to us, and we'll get you that information. Church, let us continue our worship by joining together in a prayer of confession. Creator God, in your generosity, you have given us a world of abundance and diversity, yet we are prone to greed and selfishness. You have given us a beautiful planet, yet we have damaged your creation and poisoned our environment with consumerist behavior and a lack of compassion for other creatures. In Christ, you made us brothers and sisters and intended for us to be united, yet we have built walls to separate ourselves from one another. You have given us wisdom and creativity, yet we have used those gifts to develop weapons of destruction and death. We talk about peace, yet support war with our silence and complacency. We honor the rich and powerful, yet ignore the poor and the weak. In all this, we have not lived according to your will. Forgive us, Holy One. Amen. Friends, in Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Christ help us continue to sow seeds of peace to those who are near and far. Amen. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. You're invited to share signs of peace with one another. And if you're worshiping with us online, we invite you to type in the chat a moment when you experienced Christ's peace in your life this week. (laughs) 
At this time, I invite our children to come forward for the Sermon on the Steps. morning. Good. That's what I like to hear. I have a question for you. Do we all know what this beautiful table is here for? What do we think, Addy? Community, yes. Yes, that is a very good answer. Do you know what that's called? Does anyone have an idea? Yes. Communion. And today we have special communion day. We have all sorts of different breads. Do you want to see all the different breads? Do you want to see? Let's stand up and let's get around the table and check out these special breads today. Some are crackers, that's right. Can everyone see the table? Let's get nice and close. With our hands by our sides, let's look at this table. So what do we have at communion? What two things, Emma? You see pretzels, but just like the big categories. What two things do we have, yes? Bread and wine, or bread and juice, yes, great answer. And today, we have bre bread from all over the world. So let's see, we, what do you see there? I like, I like that one. You like the smell of that one. That one's the baguette, yes. That's from French. Do you know what the baguette looks like when before it's cut up? Oh my goodness, what a great connection. That's right. And over here, we have naan from... I'm a baby. You are a baby. <laughs> from India. Do you see the naan? This one is flat, and it's great for dipping. Yes. And there's raisin bagel. Yes, Emma. The tortilla from Mexico. The tortilla. Where is the tortilla from? Mexico. Mexico. Very good. And we have uh, crumpets from England. And we have the pretzel. Where do we think the pretzel's from? The pretzel's from Germany. Does anyone here eat pretzels at home? What do you dip your pretzels in? Sometimes peanut butter. Okay, I didn't expect that. Sometimes cheese is fun. Yeah, well, we have all these breads from around the world today because it's World Communion Sunday. And we are celebrating the fact that today, all around the world, we're taking communion. Christians are taking communion. And it reminds us, even though we live in all different countries, we're all connected with our love from Jesus. Let's say a prayer together. Holy God, thank you for the gift of bread. May it bless us on this special day. And also in its ordinary ways at our tables at home. Whenever we eat it, let us remember your Jesus and his great love for the world. And let all God's people say... Amen. All right, we are off to Sunday school or back with your grown ups?
at this time, I invite our ushers to come forward to collect this morning's offering. We have a special offering happening this morning. These happen throughout the year with our denomination. Um, this is our um, Neighbors in Need offering, and this is when we all come together and offer um, money that, that is collected in our denomination. And this year's theme is Mental Health is a Universal Human Right. I think we can all agree on that. And so... Um, there's an insert in your bulletin that explains more about this theme and where the money is going. And so if you would like to donate towards this particular Neighbors in Need offering, we invite you to write NIN on your offering envelope this morning. Thank you for giving and being part of the many ministries at Claremont UCC.
God from whom all gifts come, we give thanks for what we have and we offer our shared resources this morning so that the river of blessings can continue to flow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings chapter 22. For three years, Aram and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah came down to the king of Israel. The king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? Yet we are doing nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. He said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses are your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 of them, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? They said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no other prophet of the Lord here of whom we may inquire? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one other by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imlah, but I hate him, for he never prophesies anything favorable about me, but only disaster. Jehoshaphat said, let the king not say such a thing. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and king Jehoshaphat of Judah were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, son of Chenana, made for himself horns of iron, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the prophets were prophesying the same and saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hands of the king. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the words of the prophets are with one accord and are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. When he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go up to battle at Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? He answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah said, I saw Israel all scattered on the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy anything favorable about me, but only disaster? 
Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing beside him to the right and to the left of him. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab so that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Then one said one thing and another said, until a certain spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. How? the Lord asked him. He replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Then the Lord said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Oh, man, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I'm not kidding. There is just so much drama in it. Our current sermon series is entitled Hidden Figures, and we're exploring stories of obscure characters in the Bible who don't get the spotlight very often in the life of the church. And so today's focus is on a man by the name of Micaiah who's referenced in only two short moments in these books of history in the Bible. Now, honestly, though, we could have done a hidden figure sermon on almost any of the minor prophets in the Bible who have books named after them. These are people like Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Even though their names are on the table of contents in the Bible, I am sure that none of us have them memorized, let alone know very much about these prophets. But the Bible is even full of so many other prophets who don't have the honor of having a book named after them. Prophets of both genders, actually. Moses' sister Miriam, for example, is called a prophet, and it says that the Lord speaks through her. The judge Deborah receives the designation in the Old Testament of being a prophet, as do other women such as Huldah and Noadiah. And then in the New Testament, we're told that there's a man named Philip, and he has four daughters who all prophesy. So from the very beginning, being a prophet was not just a man's game, but regardless of the gender of the prophet, so many of them have been relegated to obscurity. So to help us remember some of these prophets, I thought we might compare them to famous TV shows. The prophet Isaiah, for example, might be Doctor Who, because just as different actors have played Doctor Who throughout history, and it's still the same TV show, the book of Isaiah was actually written over hundreds of years by different authors, and it's still the same book. Or maybe it's Law and Order or Grey's Anatomy, because at 66 chapters, the book just goes on and on and never ends. Ezekiel tells the story of a graveyard where bones come back to life. So that one is definitely The Walking Dead. Hosea has some super racy elements, so we're talking Game of Thrones or Euphoria. Amos is all about social justice, and so it's like watching a really powerful documentary like Ava DuVernay's 13th or An Inconvenient Truth. Haggai is like C-SPAN. You sound really smart if you say you watch it, but no one actually does. We could go on and on here. It doesn't matter what your favorite TV show might be. It could be MASH or Brady Bunch or Breaking Bad or Atlanta. There is a prophet for you. But Micaiah, well, Micaiah is all of the trashy reality TV that we know and love. Keeping up with the Kardashians, Real Housewives, The Bachelor, Micaiah is all about the drama. Now, before we dig into his story, I think it's always important when we're talking about the prophets to give a little caveat because there's often a misconception about the Hebrew prophets. We often think of prophets as people who tell the future, and there is an element of that in today's story. But the role of the prophet in ancient Israel had a much greater purpose. Prophets arrived on the scene in Israel at the very same time as the first king because they were part of a system of checks and balances in the nation. The prophets were intended to speak up, to speak truth to power to the kings, anytime they veered off the path that God intended. And so that is the basis for the drama in today's scripture reading, is Micaiah being willing to share a hard truth, even though he knows the king will not want to hear it. The passage opens by telling us that King Jehoshaphat of Judah comes to the king of Israel. 
Now, if you remember your history of the Old Testament here, you might remember that after the famous King Solomon, King David's son, the nation of Israel splits into two. There is a coup, and then there is now a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah that continues to be ruled by David's descendants. Sometimes Israel and Judah were in conflict with each other. Other times they were individually engaged in war with other nations, and sometimes they would form an alliance with each other to go to war with a surrounding nation. The books of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, these all tell the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. And in 1 Kings 22, there has been three years of peace between Israel and Aram, a region in modern-day Syria. In the third year of that peace, the king of Jehoshaphat goes to visit the king of Israel, and the king of Israel has been getting itchy. In verse 3, he's talking out loud to his people, his entourage, his posse. He's getting worked up. He's probably pacing around. We're just sitting here, he yells, doing nothing. We're being in peace. Blah. Ramoth Gilead used to belong to us, and we need to go and grab it back. It's hard for people in power not to want more power, more land, more money, even if it means going from a state of peace to a state of war. And so the king of Israel turns to Jehoshaphat, who's just chilling on his vacation to the north, and he says, hey man, you've got to come with me. Jehoshaphat reassures the king of Israel, you're my ride or die, man. Me horses as Sioux horses. Let's do this. <laughs> Three years of peace are about to come to an end because one man isn't satisfied with the amount of power that he has. When you read through the historical books, you find that by and large, the kings of Judah are a lot more devoted to God than the kings of Israel. The Bible even tells us that Jehoshaphat, even though he's about to commit a major blunder here, usually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So before he enters into battle, he wants to consult with the prophet of Yahweh to see if he can hear a word from God. The king of Israel replies that that's no problem at all. He's got 400 bros over here. Uh, you might call them sycophants. You might call them yes men. That doesn't matter. That's just semantics. The king calls them his prophets. And they will tell him whatever he wants to hear. He gathers them around and he enthusiastically asks them, should we go and take Ramoth Gilead? Yes or super yes? And the prophets all reply in unison, oh, super duper, yes. And then it gets even weirder here. It's like they're hanging out at a drunken frat party because one of them even puts on horns made of iron and he starts running around destroying stuff and he proclaims, you're going to gore the Arameans, man, just like this. It's weird. It seems like this king is ruling like he has a magic eight ball. Should I go to Ramoth Gilead? My sources say no. Ask again later. Signs point to yes. All right, let's go. The king always gets the answer he wants. But Jehoshaphat isn't quite satisfied. He informs the king of Israel, you know that none of these guys actually speaks on behalf of the Lord, right? The king of Israel wants to consult with his people, but Jehoshaphat wants to hear from someone who's connected to Yahweh. And so the king of Israel lets out a big petulant groan. Oh, yes, there is one guy who we can ask who says he gets a word from the Lord, but I hate this guy. He's terrible. He never says anything nice about me. He always says I'm wrong. We can't talk to him. Yet Jehoshaphat insists, and so Micaiah is summoned. The messenger who goes to get Micaiah warns him, look, 400 other people have already told the king exactly what he wants to hear, and so you better say the same thing. Micaiah insists, though, I only speak the truth. Whatever God says, says to me, that's what I will say. When Micaiah arrives to the palace, the king of Israel is skeptical. He sees Micaiah and flatly states, look, I know what you're going to say, so just say it. Should I go to Ramoth Gilead or not? Micaiah's response, though, shocks him. Just like the 400 other so-called prophets, Micaiah says, go ahead, the Lord will give it into your hands. 
I have no idea why Micaiah said that at first. Maybe he just wanted to poke fun at the king, pretending to say what he knew he wanted him to say. Or perhaps he got nervous about delivering a hard truth. I have to say that I totally get that. I preach all the time about speaking up when someone says something offensive, but then there are moments where I hear someone say something ridiculously awful and I'm shocked into silence thinking, oh my God, did they just say that? Should I say something? So I get that speaking up can be difficult sometimes. But the king of Israel can't believe that Micaiah would actually say something agreeable. Stop that, he retorts. Tell me what God actually said. Okay, yeah, Micaiah admits, you're screwed. Uh, if you do this, you're going to die, and people, you are going to be scattered like sheep without a shepherd. No, the, scream, the king screams in reply, I knew you would say something bad. Get out of here. It's just this hilarious scene, right? You're going to be all right. Tell me the truth. You're going to die. Get out of here. The king can't accept anyone contradicting him. But before he goes, Micaiah informs the king that the Lord already told him that God would orchestrate the king's downfall by sending a bunch of people who would lie to him and tell him only what he wanted to hear. The rest of the chapter is so much drama. If you want to read more on your own, Micaiah is thrown into prison for telling the truth. Sure enough, the king of Israel is killed in battle with Aram, and dogs come to eat his carcass. It's a nasty scene. Less Kardashians, more Sopranos in the end. But I am amazed at Micaiah's ability here to tell the king of Israel, who although he's not named in this passage, is the infamous king Ahab, that starting this war is wrong and the results are going to be disastrous, even if 400 people are saying the opposite. And although, as I said, prophets are not meant solely to predict the future, there is something prescient about this story as it relates to our times. Because the passage gives the perfect example of an echo chamber thousands of years before the term will be invented. Ahab spends time only with people who will tell him exactly what he wants and who already believe what he believes. And when someone like Micaiah is brave enough to say the opposite, Ahab wants to block him from his social media channels as soon as possible. I'm going to let you in on a little secret about being a pastor. When I was ordained 12 years ago, I was not given a direct line to God so that I could speak exactly what God says. No one let me know God's personal cell phone number so I could send a quick text if I had any questions. I didn't receive a manual that said what the Bible really means so that I could tell you all the one right interpretation of Scripture. And at no point when I'm preaching does the Spirit of God take over and my words become God's words. I do my very best to study scripture and the history of my faith and to understand it and share my views of the Bible and spirituality and Christianity. But in the end, that's all they are. They're my views, my human, potentially flawed views. It's always incumbent upon the rest of us to be able to take what we hear, to think for ourselves, and to determine how best we can take the message we hear on Sunday and use it to live it out in the real world, to love God and love our neighbors better. Instead, in American Christianity, we have created echo chambers where we will surround ourselves with people who will tell us exactly what we want to hear and exactly what we already believe, and we will pass it off as God's absolute truth and won't ever say anything that will challenge us or help us become better people who expand our understanding of ourselves and of God. It is scary to me how many churches behave as if they have cornered the market on truth and you have to agree with everything that they say or be labeled an apostate. And the result is that you get 400 people sitting together on a Sunday all saying the same thing. And the result is as disastrous as King Ahab's plans for war. American Christianity has been co-opted by the quest for power. It is so intertwined now as a tool of our political system that it's starting to seem impossible to ever unravel it. Our faith is no longer about caring for orphans and refugees and feeding the hungry and ending war. All that stuff Jesus says is just blah, 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 not important. 
Our faith is supposed to be about comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. But American Christianity does its best to comfort the comfortable and ignore the afflicted. We need people as brave as Micaiah to declare that we can do so much better as Christians than we are doing in this country. But that's not the message people want to hear. Thankfully, our faith is so much bigger than just the United States. In the two Sundays leading up to the election, we're going to do a two-part sermon series on how our faith matters and shapes our lives regardless of the results on election night. But here's a little preview for you. God cannot be contained by any two-party political system. God cannot be held captive within the borders of this nation. God cannot be spoken for by a certain culture or race or gender or politics. God is not a member of any specific church or denomination or man-made religion. God has not co-signed anyone's version of the truth. The celebration of World Communion Sunday each year is a reminder to us that we worship a God who is alive and moving across the borders and boundaries and ethnicities and languages of this world. When we come to the communion table, we do so with people all over the world who do not think like us, who do not believe like us, who do not speak like us, who do not worship like us or sing like us or vote like us, who are not like us much at all. And yet somehow God encompasses all of us. God's love is for all of us. I believe that American Christianity is not at the end of its spiritual journey. We are not at the end of our own personal spiritual journeys. We have so much left to learn. And so my prayer on this World Communion Sunday is that we do not get stuck in echo chambers, but instead let us listen for a God who each day is guiding us into a deeper and more compassionate faith. Amen? come to a communion table that draws us into an ancient story of love, a story across the centuries, a story across the globe that proclaims that all are welcome at this table to come and be reminded that God's love is for each of us and God goes with us out of this place into the world. We love to celebrate communion here with the children of the church, and so we will invite them back. They can find their grown-ups. If you would like to bring them forward with you, please do so. As they come back, let us sing together the song on the screen.
During communion, one of our deacons will invite row by row folks to come down the center aisle. You will come and take a piece of bread. The bread is labeled, and so you can see what type of bread and the nation or region it comes from on this World Communion Sunday. We also have two different gluten-free options available as well. They are labeled, and so you can take a piece of bread, take the cup of life, and then you can dispose of the cups in the receptacles on each side. If you need to stay in your seats today for any reason, just raise your hand and one of our deacons will come and serve you communion in your seat. And before we continue, our deacons wanted to recognize someone special today. You may or you may not know this, but each month our communion bread is lovingly home-baked by a member of the church, Wendy Anson. Um, who may or may not want to be recognized today, but <laughs> she's going to be recognized anyway. And so if we could just give her a round of applause. It is such a gift from Wendy. That's why each month there's a different flavor, bread, and I think it's good. God's body does not have to taste like stale wafers. It can taste, we can taste and see that the Lord is good each Sunday of communion. And so let us come to this table. Friends, you are invited to this table. It is a meal of joy. It is a meal of hope. This is a meal that we share of comfort, a meal that gives us bravery to speak the truth, and a meal that reminds us of God's ultimate truth, which is love. So may God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us lift them up to God. Together, let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We give thanks for this bread and fruit of the vine, divine creator, for the fruit of the earth that grants us growth and harvests, and the hard work of human hands that pulled the grains from the ground and plucked the grapes from the vines. We give thanks for the connection between the planet and the people that allows such a joyful celebration as this to come to life. We break this bread remembering the words and actions of our teacher, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, from a land that is currently torn apart by war. We drink from this cup and remember that we are part of a worldwide community that practices compassion and peace and justice in your holy name. In this meal, we remind ourselves of our responsibility to practice Jesus' teachings in our everyday lives in order to resist oppression, evil, and violence. We speak aloud the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit upon these elements that they might transform us as we share them together. Allow us all to experience your extravagant hospitality once again. Allow us all to feel cared for and seen and known here at this table. Allow us all to feel your presence among us and allow us all to renew our faith and hope with this shared meal. In Christ's name we pray, amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant and it's sealed in my blood. So whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat this bread and share this cup, we proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus until he comes again in glory. Friends, let us keep the feast. Si escuchas trinar mi corazón 
me esperes, pregúntale con emoción cómo era mi vida sin amor, porque llega y llora y la ilusión vuela al cielo abierto. Sobre tu figura tocarte la piel Y el visto siguiente caminar Pede que le beses y al final Me ve de tu hermosura Stone, it's the end of the rope. The rest of the stump, it's a little alone. 
It's a sliver of glass, it is life, it's the sun. It is night, it is death, it's a trap, it's a gun. The old when it blooms, the fox and the fresh, the knot of the wood, the song of the thrush. The water, the wind, a cliff, a fall, a scratch, a lump. It's nothing at all, it's the wind blowing free. The end of the slope, it's a beam, it's a void, it's a hunch, it's a hope. And the river bank talks of the waters of March. It's the end of all strain, it's the joy in your heart. The foot, the ground, the flesh and the bone, the beat of the road, a slingshot stone, a fish, a flash, a silvery glow, a fight, a bet, the range of the bow, bed of the wheel, the end of the line, the dismay in the face. It's a loss, it's a fine, a spear, a spike, a point, a nail, a drip, a drop. It's the end of the tale. The trickle of bricks in the saw morning light. Shadow the gun in the dead of the night. A mile, a must, a thrust, a bump. It's a girl, it's a rhyme, it's a cold, it's the mumps. Plan on the house, the body in bed on the cart. They got stuck in the mud, it's the mud. A float, a drift, a hawk, a wing. A hawk, a quail, it's the promise of spring And the riverbank talks, the waters of March It's the end of all strain, it's the joy in your heart
As we join together in a moment of prayer, I will note that our conference has also asked all of our churches to pray for Gaza this morning, and so we will be doing that as well. Let us pray. Loving God, from every place on this planet, we turn to you together to pray in the midst of the forces which would separate us. In a world torn apart by war, we cry out to, with those who live in Israel and Palestine and are longing for peace desperate for peace. 
We cry out with those who have lost family members and friends in this ongoing violence. We cry out with those who live in other parts of the world and are filled with anger and outrage and despair at the headlines of children dying and innocent bystanders being killed or traumatized in this war. We cry out with those who are in the neighboring countries of Yemen, Lebanon, and Syria. We cry out with the hostages who are being held indefinitely. We cry out with those being forced to evacuate their homes and their homeland. We cry out with those who feel caught in the fear and the anger, the striking and the striking back, the terrorism and the genocide that has been crushing all souls around the world for one full year. In a world aching to be made new, we cry out with those who suffer from poverty and famine and natural disasters. We cry out with those suffering from illness and disease. We cry out with those seeking justice and equality and peace. In a world stretching toward wholeness, we also celebrate with those whose lives are dedicated to bringing forth the fruit of your spirit, first responders, advocates, counselors, therapists, medical professionals, survivors of all kinds, musicians, artists. We celebrate with those whose efforts are making the world new, environmentalists, educators, peacemakers, students, philanthropists, and entrepreneurs. We celebrate with all who gather to earnestly seek your transforming work in the world, those who actively practice compassion, those who use their work as a platform to demonstrate kindness and generosity, those who seek to better themselves at every age, and those who work to diffuse anger and negativity. Make us a world that is shaped like your communion table, where all are welcomed and all are fed. Make us a people who grow your family by practices of generosity and kindness, sowing seeds of peace in every action we take. And may we be witnesses to the truth of who we were created to be, people who belong to each other, people who belong to you, O oh God. We pray all of this together in your name, saying with one voice, our creator, bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships. Bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation of people. Bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war. Bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of this world, the God of this universe, is moving across all of our boundaries and borders we create and is calling us as people of faith into a deeper faith, a more compassionate faith, a more loving faith, a more active faith. And the words God speaks may not always be what we want to hear, but may we listen and follow, leaving this place in the peace, the love, and the action of Christ. Amen. <laughs> 